came to art through a passion for sustainability and the environment. I create work with nature, about nature, and in nature. This is the statement on Fibre Artist Zimmy Forrest's website. Because Zimmy collects, processes, weaves, and constructs work that is often intricate, but ranges from the simple to complex, where nature's beauty is showcased in a new form. Either way, the works command a striking visual presence, which is often enhanced by shadow play, negative space, and movement. Discovering a passion for basketry in the early 80s and realising that she had to consume baskets or they would consume her, it wasn't until years later that Zimmy began exploring and working with plant fibres. Engineering a variety of materials into new forms, Zimmy's skill at pushing the boundaries of this art form is evident in much of her varied exhibition work. From the empty ghost tools for her denatured exhibition, which highlighted the loss of skills and the change that is happening towards technology, to her precious ocean pieces, constructed from fishing line, which drew attention to the dwindling fish stocks and biodiversity in our seas. The viewer is engaged to marvel at both the how and the why. Simi describes herself as a fibre artist and maker, and says she's not always an artist. The art is when she pushes the boundaries. Simi's work has been exhibited all over Australia, from solo and group exhibitions in commercial and regional galleries to sculpture walks, including Sculpture by the Sea. She has also been commissioned to create over 100 artworks for public galleries, private clients, hospitals and resorts. There is wisdom in making with your hands, and Zimmy's body of work shows us her knowledge and skill of working with materials that speak to her. Zimmy is completely connected to the land and her environment and practices a daily ritual, creating ephemeral and importantly, non-documented work. She communicates a respect for the earth and creates work from nature that is as inspiring as its source. So let's find out more about the connection between nature, the fibres and the forms as we welcome Zimmy Forrest, this week's Friday Feature Artist. Hello Zimmy and welcome. Thank you. Um, Let me just welcome everybody else to um, wherever anyone else is joining us from currently now. I know lots of people are tuning in and also in the uh, future um, to all those watching this as well. Welcome. So how are you today, Zumi? Yeah, I'm really good. Yeah, I've had a good day, busy day. It's been lovely, sunny in the north coast. Yes, yes. Joining us from the north coast of New South Wales. um, Fabulous place to be joining us from. Which reminds me to acknowledge the fact that I'm in Arakal tribal land on Bundjalung country and always acknowledging those who have um, fought for nature and um, come from the natural world. Yes, absolutely. And uh, yes, I welcome everyone and um, welcome uh, to Eva as well, joining us from Sweden and uh, Vicky from Melbourne and everyone joining in and also from London. So that's amazing as well. So, so much to talk about. And I've got all these baskets behind me. I, I didn't realise that I had so many baskets. Um, let's start with how you describe yourself. So when we chatted the other day, um, you said you were a fibre artist and that you're also a maker, but that you're not always an artist. So can you elaborate on what those terms mean to you, artist, maker, fibre artist? So um, when I first started my career um, as a fibre artist, I considered myself an artist because I was um, on the cutting edge. I was at the forefront of what I was doing and I was always pushing the medium. Um, then after a number of years of burning out and um, yeah, just um, not wanting to be part of the art world, I sort of stepped aside and uh, I find myself making more and I teach more. And um, I, like I'm still part of the creative industries, there's no doubt about it. Occasionally I'll have an exhibition and if I'm pushing the boundaries with that exhibition, then I'd call it that I'm, I'm creating art. But the rest of the time I would say I'm a maker or a um, basket maker or a fibre artist, but not a full blown artist at those moments. 
full-blown artist. That's, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> it has many connotations, which I'm not going into the baggage of it. <laughs> and um, reading that statement that was on your website, um, I'm sure it sounded better when, when you said it rather than my voice, that, uh, that you create work with nature, about nature and in nature. So has nature always been the centre of your life and work? Um, I'd say intrinsically, yes. But, um, you know, I, I grew up very much in a normal um, first world community and um, I was lucky enough that my parents had a property and we often went to, um, oh my gosh, we went to a number of different properties and a number of different um, national parks and wild places. But, um, yeah, for a number of years, I like my general life was very much first world, um, regular Australian white middle class. And um, so from now, I mean, people often say, oh, what's your inspiration? Oh, yeah, nature, you know, that's, that's, I'm inspired by nature. But how do you sum up your connection to nature? Like, what, intrinsically is it that is that connection for you yeah because it's so much part of my life I don't even think about it much anymore um so I like pretty much uh, and and like you would have heard at that talk that I gave in Mittagong um my life is so um just revolves around nature it's like everything I do it's my first consideration before I use any resources from the planet that I can't naturally forage or bring to myself, then I ask, am I, um, am I using more resources than is fair? And um, am I creating any um, impact on, on, on the resources and on the planet? So my, they're the questions I always ask. Like if I take my car out, am I taking it out to do 101 different things or am I taking it out for a bit of joy? I, I very rarely would go for joy. I'd go for, like, make sure I use the resource to its fullest if I'm going to use a resource. So it's always that's the kind of um, background questions that go on for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that, um, like you said, not all, you, you, yeah, it's just intrinsically part of part. Of what yeah, you're doing. I, yeah, I always think nature first, the environment first, and the resources. Hmm. And we saw some of those images in the intro, but um, before we sort of get to the questions or, you know, the detailed questions, I think it's um, good to, to look at the images just to, um, you know, really let people uh, see more about your work. And uh, so this is from your exhibition of um, Denatured. Uh, um, Denatured was 2006. So um, that was an exhibition that I did after... Um, Hurricane Katrina and I mean there were thousands of stories that could have come through but what really hit me was how many people felt so displaced and were unable to from my interpretation and I can't say this from their their point of view but my interpretation was that they they were so they moved on to the technology bandwagon that they didn't have the skills to rebuild their lives in in, in a certain way that um you know 15 years prior we would have and so um yeah so I, I kind of um built that exhibition on the fact that um we were we were moving into technology and onto screens and the skills that we would have had um like I said 15 years prior or even five years prior were being lost and so I made a, a um, whole tool shed out of um grass and they right. were all they were all empty tools and um, and hollow and what I call ghost um, objects, and that was to signify the loss of skill or the movement into the loss of skill. So they still existed as objects, but they were empty. They had um, less form. Oh, no, they had full form, but they were. Yeah, they just didn't have the um, intrinsic um, integrity of the the actual material. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I've just got a couple of uh, close ups as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I love the tools. <laughs> yeah, well, they're so, um, you know, in that intro, I had that the how and the why because, of course, you know, we are always drawn in with the, um, you know, why is the artist made this? What does it all mean? But then I think when we see something like this, you can't help but go, 
how, and I'm not expecting you to tell us how because, you know, that's your um, artistic secret, but uh, they're just, and I think. And they're all life size and they're all like, you know, fully looking like they're functional um, tools, but they're obviously not functional in any way whatsoever, but they look like tools. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I think when we were chatting the other day, I sort of asked you about um, the sculptural aspect and, um, uh, you know, whether did you always find it easy to imagine forms in 3D and kind of do you enjoy the problem solving aspect of that? Totally. Yeah. And today, because um, I study horticulture, I'm studying horticulture at the moment. And today we actually built a greenhouse and it was me who, you know, could put it together because I, I think in 3D, I totally a 3D person. I, I, I'm, I've always imagined spaces. I'm very much, um, I think my um, intelligence, my spatial intelligence is quite um, developed. Yeah, that's wow. one way. Yeah. Yeah, I must not have been in that queue when they were handing that out, that's for sure. Well, um, I think it was in that queue, but there were plenty of queues that I wasn't in, so <laughs> <laughs> my one. I love that. And, um, you know, for something like that, I guess... It wasn't necessarily, I mean, do you make like little mock-ups or you're just um, working with the material to see if you yeah. can evolve it into some sort of lead shape? Look, it has to. It, it's not see if I can. It's like that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, that, that, that show probably took me about six months of possibly a 10-hour day every day for six months. And, wow. you know, I'm just – when I used to do exhibitions, it was – I was so dedicated. I could not think outside of that. I couldn't go to the movies or do anything. It was like, this is what I do. Unless, of course, I could take the material with me. Then I'd go to a movie or something like that and then I'd sit and weave. Yeah, 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 that, that's interesting um, mm. too. Um, so I've got a comment here. Um, or maybe that's, I don't know. I can't flash that up because I'm not sure if it's actually a real comment or not. And uh, that might open up a whole can of worms. Um, so going back to my questions, um, so how much is, um, so you said they were made from grass, those particular um, tools. How much is predetermined and how much comes out of relating to the materials? Um, I guess it depends maybe on the work. Well, okay, so if we go to Precious Ocean, um, that was totally material-based with an um, environmental statement. So that was, yeah, so you've got these pieces. So back in 2003 and four, um, the local area was going to be turned into a marine park and there was a lot of um, controversy from the fishermen in particular that they weren't going to be allowed to um, collect or fish, sorry. And um, so I wanted to make a statement and obviously it had to be a fishing line because it was all about the ocean and all about fishing. And um, my statement was that if you don't um, harvest sustainably, you won't have anything left. And the only places you'll find it is in museums or in, in um, zoos. So I, I made that exhibition to look like a museum um, yeah, exhibition. And it was, yeah, it was very beautiful. But like I said to you the other day, that was the first time I'd stepped into working with um, a non um, foraged material that right. like I had I always forage I'm constantly foraging like from six o'clock in the morning when I'm on the beach to you know like when I when sometimes I you know do a night walk at nine o'clock so if I see something I'm just always picking up so yeah. the fish I did not pick up I did we don't have that much fishing line on our beaches some beaches do but not not in this area so yeah. and part of the it was called precious ocean everything actually looked like a jewel so um wow. it was important to also work with the um the, the new the new material like the um bought material and yeah. it, it, was, it was really heartbreaking for me to step away from working with natural material but i really wanted to make a statement it was really important for me to make that statement and that's why i did it yeah they're so effective and i mean they look like they're glowing in neon but is that just because they're on the um the backlit light box um they're not actually lit are they from inside or um no, but they yeah. could be but yeah, yeah they, do. they do and you're right they really do have that incredible jewel uh yeah. sort of sapphire emerald um and yeah. we're talking 2004 here this is like 
almost 20 years ago. And, you know, te technology and lighting and everything has changed so much in the 20 years. Like I could go to a lighting shop these days and ask for a, a form of light that would fit in there, like LED lights. I think they existed back then, but, you know, you couldn't have put a normal light in it. It would have melted the material. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. I think when you get to a certain age, anything that's in the 2000s seems like, oh, that was just a few years ago until you just said um, 20 years. It's like, no, that can't, that can't be possible. Yeah. <laughs> so since we did sort of mention that um, well, you said it was 20 years um, and and you're right, we did meet recently um, at the uh, Sturt School in Mittagong um, where I heard you talk about um, your work. And so in that talk, you also talked about how you built up a hugely successful career as a fibre artist. Um, but then shortly after that exhibition, um, a few years after the Precious Ocean, um, you kind of had to reevaluate that. So what did being successful mean to you at that time? And what did you feel you need or wanted to change mm. about that? Ooh, I, do. I, um, I love my work being... Um, appreciate it. I, I know that my work is beautiful and I hear and get that kind of feedback that it's beautiful and I love that. I love being able to produce something that touches people's hearts and people are prepared to um, engage with me. I had so many commissioned works. I would get commissions consistently but I burnt out and um, yeah it became and, and the art world um, because in those days I was doing a lot of art and um, dealing with the art world I just um it was, it was, it's not a place that I like to be. And I, um, it got so, to the point that people would come to me because of, they'd hear my name and they, you know, it was, it was it too much for me. I, I'm not into having my ego stroked. I, um, and I understand if people want to gush and they want to tell me, you know, love your work, you're so amazing, you're so talented. But, you know, it's my work. It's not who I am. And, and, it, and it really, like, having my ego stroked so many times was really not healthy for me. And it, um, yeah, it was just really hard for me. And I had to step away from that. And I had to just mm -hmm. shut down totally. I, I, I shut down. I couldn't mm -hmm. deal with it. I had so much work, had too much um, stroking. Wasn't, yeah, wasn't well, it's, it's so interesting because often um, people can be on the other side, like have another day job and their art, um, and I'm going to use the, the C word of craft, you know, it's often those art and crafts are on the side and they're a side hustle and people dream of being able to have like the full-time thing, but then it can be a case of be careful what you wish for and, you know, what is it that you're sort of building and then you get there is that really what you want so yeah thanks for thanks for sharing about that experience because it is interesting to hear that so well, I like to say, um be careful what you wish for yeah it's, <laughs> yeah yeah so the um art craft basketry and basketry is seen as a craft um and like i said much of your work is like Sorry? There are some, there are some art baskets. Some baskets, when they're outside of their traditional form, they are art. But you keep going. I was here. Yeah, no, that that's so true. The the definition. Yeah, because I was going to say, what do those words mean to you? Sort of art, craft, when yeah. applied to fiber arts or basketry. Well, I don't put. Uh, I don't um, maintain the hierarchy situation in in our society where, which is. Kind of a leftover from like the last century or so where art was this high standard and you know mainly white men and um you know if you were an artist you made it and um i i don't um subscribe to that i think i'm really um supportive and have a lot of reverence for craft because those traditions for someone to keep a tradition alive i mean it's it right now in this in this time this day and age I think that is so incredibly important and it has been so undervalued and I'm so glad it's come to the fore again and you know that's one of the luxuries of living in Australia with the Indigenous people that they are starting to um, receive the recognition that they always should have received and their skills and their attack and their you know more their connection to land and what they bring. And, and the knowledge that they have and, and have had for so many centuries and allowed nature to be nature and um, 
you know, not dominated in any way. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say dominate in any way, but, you know, the, they haven't um, they haven't destroyed it quite the way we have in the last yeah. century. So, you know, for me, I, I really have a lot of respect and reverence for, for craft and those who hold those traditions and the ancestral skills that have come from the natural world peoples. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, in the intro I mentioned uh, growing up in the 80s and being inspired by um, basketry and, you know, I I mean, maybe I was just ignorant, but in seeing Indigenous art, um, uh, basket making just wasn't something that was available, whereas, you know, only a few months ago I could go into Sydney and see a whole exhibition of um, Indigenous mm -hmm. weaving, which is just fantastic that um, now you don't have to go too far. But, you know, it's it does have that um, elevated presence which it should have had and the recognition, so that, that's yeah, fantastic. So um, nature being nature and obviously the environment is a big part of um, your life and your work and we've got a video here about your work in the community. Um, so, yes, I mean, do you want to just, do you feel like you want to introduce the video or do you feel like it's self-explanatory or do you want to explain how it came about? It is self-explanatory when you see the video, but what I would like to do about the introduction, is, we're talking the Cat's Core video, yes? Yes. Yeah, okay, so the Cat's Core um, project is more than just weaving. What we, um, it, it's a big picture thing and it's a part of the regenerative po process and, and there's very few regenerative artists and this project allowed me to step into that, um, that forum and um, what happened, and, and it takes, it takes people with guts who are prepared to put their money where their mouth is. And this is what I'm talking about, about people who really care about the environment, that, you know, money isn't the object and, and saving money and things like that. And the Cat's Paw Project is a perfect example of that, where um, someone who now ha has become a friend, um, they bought a piece of land. Um, it was part of the reason they bought that particular piece of land was it had beautiful crystal clear waterways. But then when they investigated after they purchased the land, they realised that the cat's claw was um, invading and um, taking over all the, the trees. And, and ultimately what would happen is the cat's claw would pull down the trees or if there was a flood because of the cat's claw being such a big skirt and a heavy weight on the tree, it would then also pull down the trees and it would ruin the um, waterways and um, yeah, basically cause a lot of erosion. But what they also found was that everyone was um, told that the best way to get rid of it is using... Um, chemicals that are really toxic to the environment, toxic to the, um, the, the animals and all of the ecosystem that lived around that um, place. So what they decided to do was get a um, chemical-free bush regenerator in to get rid of the cat's call, and which is a really long process rather than just spraying it. And then they realised that it was such a good material that they then invited me to um, come in and teach people how to... Um, Sorry, that was just a bit of fluff flying <laughs> um, to um, teach people how to weave with this material. So then what we do is by bringing the community get together, we're offering this knowledge and this information so that they can then go to their local areas and pull down the um, material, take it away from the trees and also create um, a business for themselves. So okay. it's, it's and it's the, the business model of this um, particular um process that we're doing is that it, it will have a short life it will not just continuously grow and develop and make more and more money it's it's not about that it's yeah. about doing something for the environment which makes it a regenerative process as well so um yes this is a video it only goes for three minutes and it uh, shows a community project and it's um northern new south wales and the weed is cat's claw did you do the three minute one or the 90 second one I've got the three minutes one, but it goes quick. Three minutes is quicker than anything. Okay, everybody, I think, um, yeah, it's just really good to watch this. So here it is, Cat's Claw. Today we will be reaping and cutting a length of up to six meters to free the tree and save them. Bit by bit, and you can have fun. I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's very therapeutic actually. I love the, the whole full circle project of removing the cat's claw and then creating something out of it um, with a really beautiful mindful activity. When you have a problem, you find something you can do with it and then becomes a resource. Yeah. We start with these spokes and then we tie them together and this becomes the weaving material. The weaving goes around and around. It's such a holistic approach to this, this problem solving. It's very beautiful. And this basket weaving is such a joy. We can't stop. If you look around, everybody's just having their hands on. And um, it's such a beautiful community. This project has attracted such lovely and beautiful people. So the sense of community this, this weekend is amazing. It's, it's a beautiful environment. We've got a creek just here. We've got people who are cooking for us and we're making beautiful baskets out of a weed. What more could you ask for? It's just a lovely way to so cool. be immersed in something and be focused in something so natural and with everyone going through the process with you. It's uh, very enjoyable. It's a kinesthetic thing built in me. So it feels really good. Tribal. Fun. Fun. Nourishing. But thank you. Simple. Productive. Constructive. Unique. Very enjoyable. Hopeful. Joyous. Sharing. Love. Holistic. And expanded. Fantastic. Basket! I love that and all those so words awesome. like I was trying to write down the words nourishing joyful community mm -hmm. just and it is it is such a beautiful weekend we do it four times a year and it is it, it brings a smile to my face every time I see the video and um just knowing that we're going to be doing that is just it's just such a beautiful experience everyone gets so nourished by it. it it's a community that comes together and it's one of those magic moments it's, it's yeah. very natural, yeah. And the mix of um, age groups and the mix of things that they're all making, um, yeah, because yeah, you go, oh, there's a bit of random weave, there's a bit of twining, there's, and then you're like, oh, what is that person doing? But everyone is so engrossed in it and just... Oh. So we go out and we collect the material and then we bring it back and in, in the weekend we probably make three to four baskets depending on people's speed and, and their skill level. Wow. Yeah. Each person. I don't mean three to four baskets in the whole group. That's three to four in um, each person. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. That, I just, I mean, it's one of those things where you just like, yeah, more people need to see that and how um, just sort of, you know, a fairly simple idea. But when they're ripping those, uh, the weed away and, and you just, and yeah, then to see what, uh, what I write down, how the problem solving turns into a resource, and then as um, the full circle, as that young person said, it's um, yeah, incredible. So yeah, and very therapeutic. You know, ripping it from the the trees and knowing that you're saving those trees, and then you're saving a whole ecosystem by removing it from tree to tree. It like I mean, seriously, what, that's one of the best things you could do for the environment, and and yeah. turn it into a resource. Seriously, yeah. it's just be happy. It's just such a beautiful thing to do. Yeah. And the other day when we were chatting, we were talking about, um, you know, that transferring of knowledge, teaching people um, and teaching skills. And often people have that, but I just have to get my head around it. Um, you know, how am I, I, I can't work that out. And, you know, I was saying to you, sometimes you just have to say, you've just got to do the do. And 
basketry is absolutely a doing thing. It, it really is. I can. I often think that I'm speaking double Dutch when I um, give instructions. But um, you know, once you once you get your hands on and you know you can see the process ahead of you, it, you know people just naturally fall into it. And that's the one thing about basketry, especially if you're using the um, like you're doing a very um, continuous weaving technique. It, it's something that's existed for as we know for centuries and you you can get caught in a cosmic consciousness when you you just move in a spiral in a circle you know it's just something people have been doing forever and you become part of that that story yeah and i think it was you were saying to me um when we we're talking about that idea of trying to process things you know in the brain first that you were saying it's um the, there's a lot of wisdom in the hands of actually the hands are so connected to our lineage and that wisdom that comes out when you work with your hands. Generally, it doesn't really matter so much what, what you're doing with your hands, but basketry tends to have such a long lineage and so so much connection to um, our ancestors that it, it really pulls it forward. And, and you'd be surprised what kind of um, it, well, what I can say is that you fall into that natural rhythm and that, that rhythm is a, um, a rhythm that's connected to our ancestors and it also is very incredibly nourishing. By, by tapping into the natural rhythm that is in your body. And I, I'm touching my gut at the moment, and it's in it's in the gut. It, it really is. that It can be in the heart, less so in the head. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yes, I want to go and get some invasive vine and make some baskets, absolutely. And, You're all um, Yeah, you can all go up to the northern New South Wales. Yeah, it was so inspiring. And thanks for sharing that. It was lovely to be able to... Um, to share that with everyone. Um, and so um, I know that, um, you know, the nature and the environment are very important to you. And then this idea um, of your talk that you gave when I heard it before, you were talking about the idea of honouring a daily ritual. And I love the idea of this much discipline. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I think your discipline, if you remember, also you're incredibly disciplined and in a totally different way to me. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if I have daily uh, ritual focus. So what does the uh, daily ritual and honouring that mean to you? What does it mean to me? Oh, my God. Well, how, how, how do you actually do it? You know, what, what is the... So um, as you know, but not, I don't know if anyone else necessarily knows, I live on pretty much the most easterly point of Australia. So I'm um, on the east coast and I have, like, in the Byron Shire, it is known for the beaches, for surfing and the beautiful environment. So what I do is um, every morning I go down to the beach um, an hour before the sun rises and I um do a whole process, yoga, handstands, um, <laughs> judo, <laughs> Aikido, and um, and meditation and breathing techniques. And so in that time, I'm watching the colour change through the morning as this, just before the sun rises and then the sun pops up. And, you know, I because I do it so – I've been doing it for 14, 15 years, I think it's coming up, and for – um, of that time, I used to, um, for, for a five-year period, I used to do sunrise every morning and sunset every evening and I'd go to the lighthouse and watch the sunset. Um, but I'd walk through the forest and I'd spend an hour walking through the forest, connecting with the trees and, and you know, having conversations with them. And then, but, you know, that walk, some people could do that walk in like 10 minutes. I'm, I'm there for an hour. I'm just connecting with the with nature and then I get to the um, the the lighthouse just for the sun setting, um, you know, doing the whole colour range going down. And, yeah, that's you know, that was that was um, a very big part of my life. Yeah, and that sounds, I mean, part of me is, is thinking now, how could I do that? And I think I'd probably have to leave my phone behind. That's probably the first. Can't yeah. take your phone. No, it's, it's so irreverent. It, it just, like... Ne- like there's some things when you spend time in the forest or spend time at the um, beach, like you, when you build a relationship, you start learning things that um, is okay and not okay. And the forest will never let me take my phone. And, um, you know, same with the beach. I'm just not allowed to take the, the phone to the beach. And it's not, I don't want to, but, you yeah. know, it's, it's it's part of the um, story that's given to me that not to do that. Yeah. yeah. 
And I'm deluded to think that, well, I'm not using my phone for, you know, I'm not, I don't even have anything in my ears. I'm not expecting a call. I'm not on social media. I take it for the camera because I'm always, you know, recording the light with the camera kind of thing. But, um, yeah, maybe it is just a distraction. I should definitely um, just, uh, yeah, try, try, yeah, try without I cut off your I see all of those things as well, but what what you need to do is absorb them. You need to yeah. um, marinate in that um, that noticing the um, moments that you you know you see something and and it's like you, you may never see it again, or yeah. you may get you know for the next three mornings or you know two years apart. It's like ah, oh, there's that thing again. There's that pattern. There's that um, yeah. you know I know that the pippies are underneath the the um, sand at the moment or the crabs are there you know yeah and even um the sound I really just love listening to the sound of the bush um whether it's the the cicadas or the birds or the you know the just the sound is quite something that's um I'm just oh, as often I take and then the first thing I do is go to get my phone to record the sound like no <laughs> no I'm an imitator if um I, I won't do it now. Please do not ask me to do it. But I can imitate birds, um, yeah, mm -hmm. because I listen in a, in a different way. So I have, yeah, um, developed an amazing ability to imitate birds, which I so, and, and, yeah. Um, segue from cat's claw. Does it work the same with ivy? Can you do the same sort of thing? Yeah. Oh, look, I don't work with ivy, um, and I do know that ivy has a particular um, gassing. That um, off gassing, so um, I, you know, I'd be careful with ivy, depending on the type of ivy. But definitely, you could totally do the same thing. With, you know, if it, if it's a problem and it's a, um, it's killing trees and doing go for it. Yeah, absolutely. But um, mm. I'm not an expert on ivy. Mm. And question from Beverly, and I understand this because um, this happens when I'm in the bush. That yeah, you're trying to be on a solo thing, and then you um, have other people. So when you're doing your um, yeah, do people just know that you're Zimmy doing your thing and they have a wide berth? And... Generally, but um, part of my practice, which I really like, is being distracted and then going back in, like in back into my practice. And that that is um, part of the practice because, you know, yeah, I can do the whole, you know, you don't exist and sometimes people don't exist. But then, you know, in part of my practice, if I'm looking in one direction down the beach and I'll see a um, body movement and I'll go, Oh, that's Lisa coming, or oh, there's such, um, you know, such and such because I, you know, I'm so used to seeing um, the bodies come along the beach. But then, um, like first thing in the morning, I'm generally the only one on the beach for a couple, like you know, maybe half an hour or so. But um, you know, there's and but you you soon become you know part of the regular movement because you do have, you know, I've got certain people who come at a certain time and they'll be jogging past, and other people who always walk behind me, and other people who don't even realize what i'm yeah yeah I'm doing. Yeah. yeah and then you can have the invisibility cloak and then just um disappear i'm so good at invisible i think i love invisible i had a partner who was amazing at invisible i'm not so good at it but mm. also the other thing, like when you're i'm in the bush like i'm in byron bay it's like pretty much um tourist capital of australia really yeah. um outside of the cities and so you it's really hard to be here by yourself anyway yeah. in byron. Yeah. but early early morning as so, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's Vicky, I agree, it's not that black and white. I do like to think that I can um, enjoy the surrounds and then, um, yeah, completely just put the phone at the bottom of the bag and just not use it. Okay, yeah. so back to um, back to the work. So the idea, not the idea, the, I love, I think I've heard the terminology wool necklace or is it wool hanging? Or? Wool necklace, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was a term. I mean, is yeah. that one of... I've got I wouldn't necessarily really call that a wool necklace. I would call that a wool wool art. But um, okay. you know, the necklaces are more necklace nut. I wouldn't call that one. Up. <laughs> no. um, if you keep going through, did you want me to talk about the that? Yeah, that's more of a wool necklace. So okay. that was exhibition in two thousand and seventeen. Um, it was there was four of us in the um, exhibition, and um, originally it was just me and, and a jeweler. And so she was doing necklaces and things. So I decided that I'd create wool necklaces. So yeah, that's that's where that came from. That term. Yes, and then the one that is not a wool necklace but has sort of sculptural 
Um, are they, they abalone or what are those things in the middle? Cuttlefish. Cuttlefish, cuttlefish yeah. yeah. Cuttlefish, I think that has also angel wings in it as well. Wow. Which is a shell. Yeah. And, so and it's got wool and driftwood and a few other things. But I love that one. That's yeah. Quite, yeah. That was quite unexpected, that one. Yeah, unexpectedly gorgeous. And then these sort of more bit of a. Okay. That was from my exhibition. 2018 called Conversations with the Sun and that is yeah pretty much more of a sun type um, piece and then you've got the mandalas and the reason I call the Conversations with the Sun is because part of my meditation in the morning while I'm watching the sun and you'll see ooh, that one that's a mandala that came through from a conversation with the sun and so um, I kept getting these images for for about a year and I'm just I, I was I knew that it um a message was coming through and I couldn't work out what it was that it was being told to me. And then um, I had a, a moment of, oh, of course, that's what you're telling me. And so the mandalas came through. That's the mandala there and that's more of a sun mandala. Wow. Piece, that one. Yeah. So, yeah, that was that came through from meditation and um, conversing with the sun. Fantastic. And is that the one that... Um, yeah. Got, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a different piece, but it's um that's the um, sacred geometry piece. Yeah, that that I love that. And what an image! I love that whole series of images. They're um beautiful, taken by a photographer who who was living in the area, um, Ernesto, and he just approached me. It was a really lucky situation. He approached me and said, "Oh, you know, I'm just starting to get into photography, um, and I want to create um." some beautiful works do you mind if I use your work because I want to work with nature and it's like yeah here take this take this take this see what you can do with it and you know I, I kind of have faith that he was um quite talented but yeah. what he came up with and and I think you know it was also the model the model seemed to um live those pieces she just made yeah them that's and, you know, that, that, yeah that um uh also part yeah. of nature yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, they they did they did a beautiful job, and I I couldn't I could not have done that. Right. And then you slipped in those two words. Then you just sort of said sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> please explain so sacred geometry. Behind me, you can see um, how um, it's. I think that's a Fibonacci code. Um, uh, uh, can't even think of the term at the moment. Um, but so. Sacred geometry. Well, I'm not an expert. I told you, there, there is an expert, um, the yeah. art of practice, Stephanie. Um, we're actually doing a collaboration in a couple of months, but um, she fully understands sacred geometry and um, how it works and how to create it. I happened upon sacred geometry um, in my work by accident, and this is this this particular one is the one that um, developed. But I mean, I've I've known about sacred geometry. I'm not an expert. I yeah. Yeah, me neither. I just love the phrase. And when I hear those sorts of things like, um, yeah, using Fibonacci in an artwork or whatever, you kind of go, is that something I need to know? How? And if I knew that, how could I employ it? And then you kind of, but, uh, I don't think I'm that And person. it brings up a point of something that was really important to me when I started out and what I continue to do is I try to be as intuitive as, as possible because I do not want to be part of a system where, I'm educated to think in a particular way. I wanted to just to let it, things develop. And, and I think that's really important, especially when you're developing um, work in the art world, to have your own voice and to let it develop from what exists inside you, for, let what's marinated come out. And, um, you know, just that's how I like to be. I don't want to be too educated. I avoid education, um, external education. I allow mm. internal yeah, that's so interesting. And when we were chatting the other day, um, you said, uh, I am not my work. And that really got me thinking. And then you you explained a bit more about that. Um, and, you know, so many uh, art form creators strive to have their own voice in their work. But then your style and approach is very distinctive. So that idea of, um, yeah, how did you arrive at I am not my work, but then you've still got that strong voice. I mean, I know the two statements are not the same. Because uh, I have an internal world, a very strong internal world, and that's what comes out in, in my artwork and that's my voice. The external me, the 
um, white first world um, person is is someone who's been who exists in in the cultural paradigm that I live in. But what comes out comes out because I haven't allowed that paradigm to exist too much inside of me. So I don't. I try to avoid. Um, being indoctrinated um, and by um, yeah, living the cultural norms and in the economic society. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking about uh, teaching and, um, and you were saying that you often begin your classes talking about ethics, and I know mm -hmm. that's very important to you, and I was curious, is that about ethics about making or ethics about working in the environment and nature or a bit of both or...? Um, if all, well, all kinds of ethics that I can relate to. Um, ethics are incredibly important. Um, I think, especially if you're moving into the art world, but also um, if you're going public with your work and if you're putting it out there, I think it's really important in order to add to the community that you add a voice that doesn't already exist and that is not a copy of somebody else's work. And um, there's also ethics in collecting as well, like, you know, um, I've got to use the right finger. Oh, actually, all of those materials, they're from a, um, a bengalo palm. And so, you know, like here in the North Coast, we have thousands of um, bengalo palms, but it's really important not to collect from the same plant over and over and over again and stress it out. So, you know, know when you've collected from, like I obviously know when I've collected from it, especially if I'm taking it while it's alive. So I'm taking something um, from the plant. Um, then it's really important that I don't continuously stress that plant out. Whereas other plants that I um, forage from, they're, they're dead by the time I've come and collected. So, that, you know, it's, it's what you're doing is actually helping the plant and helping the owner of the property to remove that material because you're going to use it for something else. Yeah. Um, so that's not such a problem. But as far as having a voice, I think it's incredibly important that you, I, I say copy as much as you want, but don't, um, put it publicly, don't teach it, don't sell it, don't call it your own, don't post it unless you've got permission of the person that you've copied from because I think, you know, it's, it's. I think the thing that's really missing is ethical and moral um, boundaries and also um, respect for other people who've put so much time into developing work and um, yeah. the things that I think is incredibly important. Are you getting those dings? Can you yeah. hear them? Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Sorry. Well, yeah, we had a few technical issues, everyone, before we started, so we're too scared to actually touch anything now because we might lose the connection. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're more at home with baskets and uh, fibres than we are with the current technology. Um, but, yeah, it's so interesting to raise all of those things. I mean, it goes back to, um, you know, being a kid and collecting shells. And I think from my personal experience, like the pocket finds kind of started that way as well because... I was on holiday down the coast and I'm, you know, at the beach collecting shells, doing all that thing. And then you think, no, I'm not going to take them home. I'm actually just going to return them to where I collected. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to photograph them because I did have my phone with me. Um, and then I'm just going to, yeah, record that moment of finding them and being with them and touching them and observing them. And then I'm going to take them back to the beach and return them and uh, that's kind of actually how the whole pocket fit thing sort of started whereas yeah around here I mean, um i've got heaps of banksias so that's and casuarinas for days and so i can collect some of that stuff without worrying too much about uh, manly dam losing them yeah right yeah well what i was going to say is like and what the um that message that came through about phones and people feeling safe if that's what you need that's absolutely fine the message that's come to me from nature is they, for me, not to take my phone in. So other people need to do that. That's great. Go for it. Mm -hmm. So talking about materials, um, what material do you enjoy working the most with? Whatever I need at the moment. <laughs> Whatever. Like if I'm working on something, obviously this one, all of them actually, uh, Bangalore Palm. I love Bangalore Palm. I have so much access to them. Um, so, you know, um, if but if I... Um, making something that um, requires um, harakeke or um, uh, Dracaena Draco, then they're my favourite material at the time. Whatever yeah. I need to do is my favourite. And I, I mean, gosh, I love fibre. I love the textures. I love the colour. I love that it's a gift from nature. And um, what, you know, that's 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 what it's about for me. Yeah, yeah, I love the Dracaena. 
um, uh, that one there, that just and that's that's hard to find this um, the orangey thing here. Yes, you'd be surprised actually. It's um, it's 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 pretty much everywhere. But um, it, you've just got to see it. You've just got to um, know what you're looking for and and be able to collect it. And and yeah. and that's one of those ones that you collect only when it's died off from the plant, like it's dried. You wouldn't take it green. It's crazy to take it green. It takes like two, three months to dry. And if you've had any rain in the meantime, it just yeah. 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 yeah, and I've only dabbled in um, basketry, but um, when I have been to workshops where they've foraged the fibres and collected them and suddenly and you hear words like lamandra and then you're walking in the neighbourhood and you're going, is that it? And then, you know, it's that whole world that opens up literally um, all the time you just walk past all that green stuff down the side of the road and suddenly you're like, hang on, I think I can use this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, like, you know, I literally could go um, out the door and within 100 metres make, you know, find enough material to make possibly 20 baskets, you know, 20 different baskets. So wow. there's so much material around. And, and I have to say suburbia is the ideal place to collect and forage and harvest because there's so much material that people are um, planting in their gardens that they absolutely have no idea what to do with. They otherwise throw into their compost or they just, you know, throw it onto some pile and mm -hmm. burn it. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so yeah, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And this is a really interesting uh, point from Kathy too, um, that idea of leaving an off offering. That's very much the Maori way of doing things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't personally. For me, it's... Um, like I, I have a conversation with the trees, you know, I talk to the to nature and so um, that's that's the way I connect but I know the Māoris have beautiful rituals around that and I, I recommend that anyone who can work with a Māori weaver um, spend some time with them and see the way that they have such reverence and respect and lineage and um, mm. yeah, give it mm. a go. Yeah. Mm. And then on the topic of ethics, um, yes, being original also acknowledges... Um, the bravery of self work and respects for other artists that's that's so true and mm. it's um, something that is definitely worth always you know we often get carried away with the learning and the wanting to make that um, sometimes you just need to and it's important to do that and and that's why you know you go to a class and and you, you've got every right to copy and make as many times as you want until you have your aha moment and once you've had your aha moment you know which direction you want to take it, and that is incredibly important. So, like in 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 all art forms, like you know, if you look at um, art schools, you copy and you do certain things so that you develop this the hand eye skills, the um, aesthetic skills, so that then you have your aha moment and you know where you want to go with it. Mm -hmm. And so what are you up to at the moment? What is there anything that you're sort of a project that you've got um, underway or something that you're working on uh, at the moment? I've got a couple of commissions I'm working on. I had a wonderful exhibition um, just recently with the Cats for, um, called Divine Lines and um, I'm still making pieces of those um, for commissions. And um, it's on a slightly side um, thing, besides the Cats Claw weekend coming up um, in September, um, I'm working with some um, ancestral skills um, people and we're developing a business for um, yeah, Bushcraft Village to also a community event, um, a community um, cooperative business to teach people um, bush skills and bushcraft skills and um, ancestral skills. Wow, that, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, love that term, bushcraft. Um, mm. Yeah. Very old. Um, it's been <laughs> it's been around for for quite a while. Yeah, sometimes it's terrible because when um, people say words and then my imagination sort of goes off and I'm just you know I'm like oh yes and I'm imagining and no I've got to come back. Um, so are there any um, sort of artists or makers that spring to mind that inspire you either past? Um, look, I can get inspired from things that are not necessarily in my genre. But, um, you know, from the beginning, um, we had Rosalie Gascoigne in Australia. We got Andy Goldsworthy, um, Chris Drury. Um, and then, like, yeah, would I say? Um, yeah, okay, like they'd be some of the ones that I definitely say 
from the past that still have an impact on me and they get they were the ones who gave me permission to do what I do because mm -hmm. you know you know the art world's so full of paintings and and um, bronze and marble sculptures so to work with the natural materials they they were the ones that had such an impact on me um gosh there's so many so many people doing wonderful things that inspire me I have to say and to it, it like you know there's so many people I can't name anyone. yeah yeah and for those people there's a Dutch ceramicist um Cecile Kemperink, and she is like a master artist and I consider her so amazing because she sticks with the same form and just takes it, she pushes the boundaries of that to a degree that I just go, she's amazing. And then we have a local painter, Emma Walker, who always inspires me. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. And uh, the first woman that you just said, how do you spell her surname? Um, K-E-M-P-R-I-N-K, Kemperink. Yeah, she's okay. Dutch, Kemperink, Kemperink. Oh. Um, she works with um, ceramics, mainly porcelain, but not necessarily just porcelain, but she works in circles and she just pushes oh. the circle continuously. Okay. Amazing. If we didn't quite get the spelling, we'll have to put that um, in the uh, comments afterwards. Um, yes, and for those of you that uh, are not aware of Rosalie Gascoigne, um, yeah, big really fan. I mean, so... Um, you know, kind of disarmingly, deceptively simple, but then incredibly just, wow. Um, yeah, I was in Melbourne a couple of years ago when um, she had her, there was an exhibition of her work with um, Lorraine Connolly Northey. And oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I could have spent hours there, you know, just standing in front and then just, oh, just the whole, but, and the beauty of the materials and just, oh, just the arrangements and it's that kind of thing where you go oh if only I could come up with something like this it would just be yeah and she was made in Ikebana and that's where she got her aesthetic from and she just developed it from there so yeah yeah another rabbit hole well thank you I mean our time has flown by and um thank you so much for sharing all of the wonderful knowledge generosity time so many interesting and i hope that people were just inspired to if they haven't um put fibers together before and woven something then you know what i mean what is it that you love about what you do how would you summarize that in 50 minutes uh, the fact that i'm having such a low impact on the environment that that's the the thing that inspires me the most just to keep otherwise i would have been a painter or god knows an accountant or a banker god <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, because I really care for the environment and, and nature is so important to me. Yeah, that's now there's more of it. And that is a perfect note to end on. So, again, thank you, but also thank you to our wonderful um, audience, everybody out there, um, for all of your comments and um, everything and for, for tuning in tonight because I know it's not always easy to tune in live, but we really do appreciate that. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in in the future too. So thank you, Zimmy. I'm going to play our outro. But, yes, everybody, if you can keep um, putting your words of gratitude and thanks, we really do appreciate it. So Thanks, Lara. And thanks to your team. Yes, thanks, everyone. And see you next time. <laughs>